Uh, you did well. Um, you did it well. Um, I've always intended for you to be able to um, correct them. Um, I do need you to learn from your mistakes so you don't do the same thing on your AP exam. I just wanted you to have the experience of having a time limit and not being able to have access to your notes uh, when you're doing them and see where you're at. So to evaluate yourself, I've always told my students, if you get two out of the three uh, points available for each question, um, you should be in good shape. So if you got a six or above, uh, you're doing pretty well. Um, that's what I want from you all. If you got a seven, uh, some of you here did seven and eight, that's really good. Some of you here got a hundred on it. Um, that means you're well prepared to take on the score comparison question on your real exam. But if you got six out of the nine, you're on your way. However, for the purposes of this class, that's a 60. So I do need you to correct them. I'm going to allow you two um, chances to correct. One tonight, and then another time once I finish correcting your re-corrections. Um, so if you would like a better grade, make sure you correct it tonight. I'll go ahead and correct it again, and then let you do it one more time, and that would be the last time. You want to have any questions? Some of you don't have a lot of work to do uh, for those codas because you had a seven or you had a six, so you had three corrections that you need to do. Um, so I do encourage you to go ahead and fix those so that you can get the grade that you think you need to do. You want to have any questions? Uh, remember, today after school, we're going to be doing your, um, we're going to be going over the test if you would like to do a retest on it. Uh, if you would like to get the points that you gained during that little quiz, attend the tutoring also and I'll give you those points. You don't have to do the retest to do so. Uh, but if you would like to do the retest to test for uh, points that you have, half the points you may have missed, make sure that you come. Only the people that signed up are able to come today. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you do so. I'll be closing that um, by lunch today at 1 p.m. You want to have any questions on that? So it's going to be from 4.20 to 5.20. We maybe we'll finish earlier because I'm going to be picking and choosing which questions that we're, we're going to do. Um, but come if you feel like you need more points for the last six weeks. Any questions? All right, we're starting a brand new six weeks, guys. It's gonna go really fast until the end of the year. Uh, so hopefully uh, you uh, stay on task. All right, we're gonna have a quiz at the end of the period. Hopefully, the plan anyway. Let's go over this unit four, um, lesson one, core values and political social decision notes. Yes. In the United States, we have a political culture. So what is a political culture? These are widely, sh widely shared values and beliefs that most of us in this country have in common. Widely shared values and beliefs about government and about politics and how government should be. So these are widely shared values and beliefs that almost all Americans share. These values are going to be different per country, but in the United States we have our own unique American political identity, political culture. And this political culture affects policy making in government. Because of these shared values and their shared beliefs, it affects what kind of policies get made later on. So our values and beliefs may be different from Russia's values and beliefs, from China's values and beliefs, but these are values and beliefs that most Americans have in common. So today, I'm sorry? Oh, it affects policy making. Today, we're going to talk about some of these core values and beliefs that we all have in common. The first one is equal opportunity. What does equal opportunity mean? It means that in the United States, most Americans believe that everybody should have an equal chance of being successful. Everyone should have an equal chance of being successful. That's something that most Americans believe, especially after the 1960s. That's something that um, we all have in common, or not most of us have in common. Maybe you don't believe in this core value, but most Americans do. That everybody should have an equal chance of succeeding in the United States, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your wealth, you should have an equal chance of succeeding. All right, next, free enterprise or capitalism. This is the economic value that most Americans share. Free enterprise or capitalism. People should compete freely 
in the marketplace. People should be, compete freely in the marketplace with little or no interference from who? From the government. But this is something that a lot of Americans feel about our economy, that we should be able to buy, sell, and compete in the marketplace without government interference. So people should compete freely in the marketplace with little government interference. In other countries, economy is very much controlled by the government. In the United States, that's not so much. We let the economy, for the most part, run by itself with very little government control because this is a value that we do have an opposite to socialism and communism in the United States. We like our government to be hands off when it comes to our economy because free enterprise and capitalism is something that we were born with um, as a country. Next, individualism and self-reliance. Individualism and self-reliance could mean two different things. But this is a value that was shaped at the western frontier. Those of you that remember from a push, as we expanded to the west and people started migrating to the west, they've gotten accustomed to who's not really in the west so much. The government is not really in the west so much. So they got accustomed to living by themselves, relying on themselves instead of relying on government. Um, if you ever played the video game Red Dead Redemption, a part of that um, storyline is about um, being by yourself, not letting government, um, not relying too much on government, being free in the old west. So individual rights, so individualism can mean two different things. Number one, the belief that our rights should always be protected. That there are some individual rights that government cannot take away from us. And number two, independence from the government. The ability to make our own decisions, the ability to make our own choices without government interference. So that's another core value. And Americans are usually more individual, individualistic compared to other countries. In other countries, they have a sense of, they have more of a sense of community, uh, where people are working together. In the United States, it's very individualistic. That's a value that most of us share. Another value that, that we share thanks to the American Revolution is the idea of a limited government, a political system in which government is restricted. Again, this is a principle of the Constitution. A government that is restricted, a government that is not all powerful, a government that has limits. And in this country, what limits our government? What tells government what it can and cannot do? Constitution. The Constitution of the United States limits your government. And we did that on purpose. We designed that on purpose. We were, we as a country, were founded on the idea that government should be limited. So this is a value that we still have today. Anybody remember what rule of law means? In the United States, no one is above the law, which means that all the laws of the United States have to be applied to everyone equally. The laws have to be applied to everybody equally, regardless of your wealth, Regardless of your political position, it doesn't matter if you're the lowliest of us or you're the president of the United States. Laws apply to everyone else the same as everyone else. Laws should be applied fairly to everyone in the country. So these are our core values. These are the things that make us who we are as Americans politically. We believe that government should stay out of the economy. We believe in individualism. We believe in, that everybody should have equal opportunity. But yet, when you turn on your television today and you go look at the news, if we have similar values and we have similar beliefs as Americans, how come when you turn on your televisions, people are shouting at each other? How come there's riots in the streets? How come Republicans and Democrats are in each other's throats? If the values and the beliefs are the same, how come there's disagreements? <coughs> how come whenever the Supreme Court makes a decision, more often than not, not all nine justices agree with the decision, there's a disagreement? It's because we may have the same values at the core, but the way that we interpret those values may be different. So we usually have the same values, but the way we understand those values may be different, and that can cause um, arguments, and that can cause this uh, differences. 
So I'll give you an example. Let's take a look at the core value of equal opportunity. Everybody should have an equal chance of succeeding. Let's take a look at these two people and how they interpret equal opportunity. Alyssa interprets equal opportunity to mean that government should not interfere in people's lives and allow them to succeed or fail on their own. Government should not choose who wins or loses. Government should leave people alone and let them succeed or fail on their own. That's what Elisa believes is equal opportunity. David has a different view of what equal opportunity is, a different interpretation. To him, it means that government has a role in making sure everyone, even those who are economically or socially disadvantaged, has an equal opportunity to succeed. Which means to him, equal opportunity doesn't mean that government is absent. Government has a role. And what is that role? To help make sure everybody has equal opportunity. For Alyssa, government should be absent. Government should just let people fail or succeed on their own. That's how you achieve equality. But for David, government has a role. Government should be there to pick people up, to make sure that people who are economically or socially disadvantaged are, have the same opportunity. Do you see how there could be disagreements between the two? Even though the value is the same, how they, they interpret that value is different. Who thinks that government should be involved, David or Alyssa? David does. But Alyssa doesn't think so. But that, they have the same values, which is equal opportunity. Anyone have any questions on this? This is what creates a liberal, and this is what creates a conservative. It's not that they have different values. It's because they interpret those values in a different way. Anybody know what Alyssa would be today? Would she be a conservative or would she be a liberal? She would be a conservative. She wants a smaller government that's not too involved. While David would be a what? Or would be a liberal because he thinks there's a role that government can play. They have the same values, but how they interpret them is different, which causes differences. Any questions about this? I've made this example before that I listen in my class. This is not for, uh... <laughs> All right, we'll talk about free enterprise. Alyssa interprets free enter enterprise to mean government should stay out of the economy and allow businesses to compete, succeed, or, or fail on their own, depending on what the free market allows. David believes it differently. David thinks free enterprise to mean that government has a role in making sure that the marketplace is competitive and beneficial to all by eliminating monopolies, making sure that there's regulations to protect consumers, workers, and the economy. Does everybody get what I mean by here? Who thinks the government has a role? Liberal. Liberal. Liberal believes that when it comes to the economy, government has a role to play. He's not gonna pick who wins or loses, but he has to make sure, the government has to make sure that the, the, there's competition. And that means eliminating monopolies, just like what Teddy Roosevelt did with monop monopolies and trusts. Eliminating monopolies, making sure that it's competitive and lively. Making sure that workers are protected, that there's regulations in place. For Alyssa, she wants government to be hands-off completely. Which one would be the conservative interpretation? Alyssa's interpretation or David's interpretation? Alyssa's interpretation. David thinks government has a role. They have the same value, but how they interpret them are different. Any questions about this? Next example. Individualism. Alyssa interprets individualism as being independent from government, not relying on government, not being too reliant on government. David also values individualism, but to him, he believes that government has a role in protecting individual rights from states or businesses to try to infringe upon them. Who thinks government has a role? David or Alyssa? David. David again, which would make him more liberal or conservative? More liberal. But they believe in the same thing. They believe in individualism. But for David, government has a role in protecting that individualism. For Alyssa, if government is there, then I'm not an individual. Does this make sense for people? Any questions about this? So we may have the same core values at the very core, but how we interpret them um, creates differences in the United States. Liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats are closer than what you think they are. It's just 
they interpret those values in a different manner. All right. So core values and their interpretations create different ideologies. This interpretation of core values create, and this is an important word today, make sure to remember this in your head, political ideologies create different political ideologies. The way that we interpret these values create different political ideologies. In the United States, what are the two most dominant political ideologies there is? Conservative. Conservatism and liberalism. The way that we interpret these values create different ideologies, create different political ideologies. But we don't only have liberalism and conservatism, there's socialism and fascism. Uh, but the two core values of the United States, or the, core, uh, the two main political ideologies are liberalism and conservatism. So different ideologies are represented in government right now. Most Democrats, are they liberal or conservative? Anybody remember? They're more liberal. Republicans are more what? Conservative. And guess who's in government? Conservative and liberals. There's Republicans and Democrats in government. So those liberal ideologies, those liberal ideas, and those conservative ideals, every single day in government, in the state governments, in the local governments, in the U.S. government, they're always clashing. Those interpretations are always butting heads. So different ideologies representing government leading to clashes in ideologies. There's clashes in ideologies every single day in government. The way we interpret these values create different ideologies. So this is a spectrum of ideologies. We call liberals to the left and we call conservatives to the right. The extreme left of liberalism, you have socialism and communism, where there's a lot of control given to government. On this side, you have libertarianism, where there's not a lot of control in government, and then we have fascism also. Leading to clashing and what? Of, of um, ideology. More Euro European countries are usually to the left of here. We're more to the center. We have a lot of liberals and conservatives, so that balances each other out. Uh, so China is more communistic, so it would be this way. Yeah, if you look at countries that are ruled by monarchies, like in the Middle East, they would be more in this way. Sorry. Yes, sir. So if the government was controlled by one party, um, they could It could lead to that, yes. It would be easier to take us in that direction. If the Democrats control all of government, then it would be easier to take us to communism, and it would be the same thing for the Republicans. All right, another word you need to remember today is political socialization. Political socialization is what's happening to you right now. It's a process. It's a process in which you acquire your values and beliefs. The process which you acquire your values and beliefs about politics. The process in which you acquire your values and beliefs about government and about politics. As you're growing up, you're acquiring values and you're acquiring beliefs. This is your political socialization. This is what made you who you are. If you're a liberal right now, it's because of your socialization. If you're a conservative right now, it's because of your socialization. As you're growing up, you're acquiring new values and you're acquiring new beliefs about politics and about government. And that is your socialization. Keep this in your head. Political socialization is the process that brought about your political ideology. Your political socialization made you a liberal. Your political socialization made you a conservative or communist or fascist, hopefully you no know fascism. But political socialization is what led to you being who you are. And it's still going on. I guarantee you right now, those of you here that think that you're a liberal in a couple of years from now, you may not think so. Same thing for those of you that think that you're a conservative because political socialization does not stop until you stop breathing. You're acquiring new ideas, your values are changing. Socialization is a process in which you acquire ideas, values, and beliefs about government, about politics, it's what made you who you are currently, and it's what's going to make you who you are in the future. 
politically anyway. Any questions? So make sure you remember in your head, political socialization is a process. It leads to my political ideology. What makes me who I am right now in terms of being a liberal or a conservative is because of my socialization, the way I was brought up, the things that I acquired as I was growing up. So what contributes to your political socialization? Many different things. Your friends, if you're surrounded by liberals, you're more likely to be a liberal. The region of the country that you live in, your religion, um, these things co contribute to who you are right now politically. The more religious you are, for example, the more likely you are to be conservative. The less religious you are, the more likely you are to be liberal. If you live in a place that has a lot of liberals, you're more likely to be a liberal. In the Valley, we're one of the few places in the, in the state of Texas that's mostly liberal. So more likely you grew up with liberal friends, with liberal parents, which means you are more likely to be liberal. Does that make sense for everybody? What's the most important factor to your socialization? If all of these contributes to who you are politically, which one of these contributed the most? School contributed a lot. What we're doing right now, family. your family is the most important thing. Whenever your family talks to you about politics, they didn't even have to talk to you. In the dinner time conversations that you have with your family, whenever they talk about Trump, whenever they talk about politics, you take those values, you take those beliefs, and you put it in you. It contributes to your socialization. They have a monopoly in your time. They have a monopoly on your commitment. So they affect you a lot. I know a lot of you here like to think of yourselves as free thinkers and you're not like your parents, but according to statistics, you're just gonna be just like them. If they're conservative, they're, you're probably gonna be conservative. If they're liberal, you're probably going to be liberal. It's because, they it's not the right word, but they brainwash you so much. <laughs> you are who you are because of these factors, and the most important of these factors is your family. Any questions about that? There's a lot of factors that contribute to your political socialization that made you who you are. Family is the most important one. Any questions? That's why in this class, um, a little bit coy about my, my own values and my own beliefs, um, because I don't want you to adopt them blindly, because teachers are very influential in that, and you're in an age where you absorb everything and your values and beliefs are very malleable. But you may have met a teacher that's very open about his conservatism or liberalism, and maybe that contributed to your political socialization. I don't want to contribute to your political socialization. What I want to do is give you the information and you decide for yourself. But there's going to be times where my biases come through. I apologize for that, but I'm only human. All right. There are other factors that contribute to your socialization. And let's talk about these factors right now. This is probably the most important part of today's lecture. This is what you're going to have on your quizzes. Other factors that contribute to your socialization is the general 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 generalization effects. Generational effects. Generational effects. So this is the idea that people that grew up together in the same decades, they experience the same experiences. So right now, you guys are belong to the same generation. Not my generation, but you belong to the same generation, which means you have common experiences, which means that would lead you tendency to, uh, to have similar values or similar beliefs based on those common experiences that you've experienced. So derived from common experiences, of people that came of age at the same time. Because you guys are coming of age at the same time, you're experiencing the same things, you are more likely to have the same values and beliefs. So, I'll give you an example. People that grew up during the Great Depression, where they all experience being hungry, unemployment and being miserable and hopeless and when they saw what government did with the New Deal where government became more involved in people's lives, government tried to help out, 
government offered a helping hand during the Great Depression, they were more likely to support government helping hand. So people that came of age during the Great Depression are more likely to be liberal because they, they, they've experienced what a liberal government can do. They've experienced what it's like not having government to help out and then having government helping out during, during um, the Great Depression. So because they came of age at the same time and they had the same experiences, they, that might lead them to having the same values and beliefs. So people that grew up during the Great Depression, that came of age during the Great Depression, they are more likely to believe that government can help people, that government can do a lot of good, because during their time when they came of age together, they, they've experienced that. They had that common experience. All right, let's talk about the Cold War. This is where most of your grandparents grew up, these are the baby boomers of the United States. They grew up at the same time during the Cold War, where any second, any moment, nuclear annihilation was a play, was an option. Where there's this fear of human extinction every single day of their lives. So, if you grew up during the Cold War, you're more likely not to like communism or socialism. Why not? That's what Russia was. Because that's the what? That's what Russia was. That's the enemy. So socialistic ideas, communistic ideas, liberal ideas, you may reject them because you grew up with the same experience. You grew up at that time where Russia was the enemy, communism is the enemy, socialism is the enemy. If you ever wondered why in the United States we don't have universal health care, for example, because that's a socialist idea. And when you say socialism to a lot of the baby boomers, to a lot of your grandparents, they reject that immediately because their experiences when they're growing up is socialism, communism is the enemy. Does that make sense? Yes. This is called the generational effect. People that grew up or came of age at the same time, they've experienced the same things, leading them to have the same values and beliefs. People that grew up during the Cold War had the experience of communism was the enemy. So now, everything that's communistic or socialistic, that those are things that they reject. Because in their heads, that's the ideology of the enemy. Any questions? All right. I'll give you another example of a generational effect. So have you ever heard this saying before? Back in my days, I paid for college myself with hard work. And today's generation are lazy. They want everything from the government. So you have young people today working hard to get free college tuition. You have people like Bernie Sanders who are promising, like if he gets elected into office, he's got one of his policies is going to be um, taking care of your student debt, for example. There are a lot of people who are against that because they think that's relying on government too much. During my day, I was able to pay for my own way to college. So my generation and your generation were accused of being lazy, we don't work hard enough, or we want government to help us with everything. This is where generational effect comes into play. Because when those baby boomers grew up, they did in fact pay for their own way to college. But here's the thing, back then, Look at what college was like for Yale. $2,500 to an Ivy League school. For now, what is that? What is it now? It's about $4,600 or $46,000. Back then, if you work five hours a day, you can pay off your college. Today, if you want to pay off your college, you're going to have to work 17 hours a day. So when those baby boomers say, you guys want everything from the government. When it was my day, I worked hard and I was able to buy it, to pay my way to college and pay for, for housing. It's because they did. And they think, why can't you do the same thing? It's because right now, the experiences, colleges are more expensive, paying for your own house is more expensive. Today, it may be the fact that you can no longer pay your way to work your way to college because colleges have become too expensive. Does that make sense? So your grandparents, they grew up being able to afford college by working a little bit, being able to afford a house by working a little bit. 
So they're more likely not to depend on who? Not to depend on government. But today, it may be that you have no choice. So your generation and my generation are more likely to look to who? Government. More likely to look to government. Because our experiences are different. Does that make sense? This is generational effect. Our common experiences will lead us to have the same values or the same beliefs. All right. So baby boomers value independence. They value individuality. Because during their time, they were able to work their way to a mortgage. They were able to work their way for tuition. That was a realistic possibility. But my generation and your generation, that opportunity is no longer there. So we're, we're more likely to seek whose help? The government's help. So that common experience led us to have different values. So this is called the generational effect. All right, the next contributor to your political socialization is the life cycle effect. All right, so what does that mean? It's exactly what it implies. Changes in one's values as they grow up. Changes in one's values as they grow up. Experiences of growing up can change our values. As we grow up, we're going to encounter experiences that might change our attitude towards government. Sometimes we won't want, we want to keep government close, and sometimes we want to push government away, depending on those experiences as we grow up. But we're all going to share the same experiences. After, after this year, you're all going off to college. After college, most of you are going to get married. After you get married, you're going to have kids. After you have kids, you're going to grow old and you can no longer work. So we're going to have similar experiences with each, uh, from each other. And those experiences may lead us to have different values, and those values may change. So what do I mean by that? Right now, you're going to be college students. And for the first time in your life, you're going to have to pay for your insurance. You're going to have to pay for college tuition. You're going to have to pay for rent. So you're more likely to look to who? The government for help. Because you're going to be faced with that responsibility. But then you get a job, and you grow up, and you have a family, and every single cent counts. So that means, do you want higher taxes or lower taxes? You're gonna have, you're gonna want have lower taxes, and you're gonna wanna have government back off. So when you were young, you want government close, helping you out. But then as you grow up, you want less taxes, you want less government regulations, so you wanna push government away. And then you're going to get really old, and you're not going to be able to support yourself. So who do you want to be there? You want government to be there. So this is called the life cycle effects. The experiences that we're going to experience as we grow up can change our values and attitudes about government. Anyone have any questions on this? So as we grow up, we're going to have similar experiences that may change our values and attitude towards government. Sorry? So these are experiences that we're going to encounter as we grow up. Generational effect is common experiences that your that generations feel together, like the Great Depression or the Cold War. Does that make sense? This is like having kids, going to college, things that you experience growing up. All right. Number three, political effects of major events or broad social trends. Sometimes there's something that happens in the United States, some traumatic thing, a crisis that changes everybody's perspective about government, that changes people's values about government. In your life, not in your lifetime, but in my generation, what's the biggest thing that happened in my generation? So in my generation, people are more likely, because we felt that, we experienced that trauma. You were kids or you were babies and you didn't really experience that trauma, but we did. 
So people in my generation were more likely to give up some freedoms and liberties to government in exchange for what? For protection and national security. We're the generation that gave into government surveillance. We're the generation that allowed terrorists to be tortured in Guantanamo Bay. We were more likely to give up liberties, to give up rights to government in exchange for that national security and protection because of that one single traumatic event. Your generation is involved in social media, internet. So what's something that's very important for your generation? Gun control. When it got in this age of, sorry? School shootings might be one. Well, that could be something that's very important because it's been happening more and more in the United States. So that's more, it's gonna make you more likely to want gun control, to have government involved. Well, when it comes to social media, for example, which your generation grew up with, what are you more likely to want to protect? Privacy. Your privacy. So privacy is something that's very important to your generation. Does this make sense? So a traumatic event, a social trend can impact someone's value, uh, someone's values and beliefs, someone's ideology. People during the Watergate scandal, what did that make people do? In case you don't know what Watergate scandal is, it's Richard Nixon committing crimes, right? Spying. So it's gonna make more make it more likely for Americans to be more trustful or less trustful of their government. Less trustful of their government. So those values change depending on. Um, something traumatic or something that's a crisis in the United States. Anyone have any questions about political or major events? Sorry? I never understood net neutrality. Net neutrality means that companies cannot control um, the speed in which you are able to access certain websites. Uh, today, the United States says that you cannot regulate that. If you're a Spectrum or Comcast, you're not allowed to make Netflix faster than you are Hulu or Pornhub, for example, right? If we eliminate net neutrality, it means Spectrum can make your access to Netflix faster or slower. So they can make you pay more to have a faster access to Netflix, for example. All right. Or porn hub, I don't know what you're into. <laughs> All right. Last, a last impact or effect on somebody's ideology is globalization. Globalization. The fact is, more than any place in human history, we are more connected to each other than ever before. The lower trade barriers, which means lower tariffs, more trading between countries, advancements in communication and transportation. Now you can get to China in two days if you want to. Means we are more interconnected, we are more globalized, we're more interconnected to each other. And as we're exchanging goods from one country to another, we're not only exchanging currency and toys and services, what are we also exchanging? Ideology. We're also exchanging ideologies and values and political beliefs. So right now, we're affecting other countries' values and beliefs, and we're being affected by other countries' values and beliefs. Does that make sense? Because today, we're more globalized, we're more interconnected with other countries, we have more relationships with other countries, ideas are being exchanged all the time, values are being exchanged all the time. We're, we're affecting other countries' values and beliefs, and they're also affecting us. Any questions about that? So, I'll give you an example. Japan and South Korea, after World War II, became very close with the United States. They became very close trading partners, economic partners. But not only that, we're trading ideas with each other. And they've adopted a lot of American ideas, like capitalism and free enterprise. Today, these two countries are one of the wealthiest in the world. And they're experiencing a golden age in terms of their economies. And that's because, partly, they adopted American values and they adopted American ideas. Does that make sense? South Korea, South Korea, Japan, they're very capitalistic. They have a, who did they get that from? They got that from us. They took that value from us. However, today, we're also getting affected by other countries. 
in Europe where they're more liberal, some things that we would have never adopted in 20 years ago or 10 years ago, socialistic and communist ideas, especially out of the Cold War, or something that's a no-no in the United States. But today, you have major presidential candidates like Bernie Sanders and, and Mary, um, what's her name, Elizabeth Warren, advocating for free college, socialized health care, communistic and socialist ideas, because we're, we're getting those from Europe, we're getting those from Canada. It works in Canada, it works in Finland, it works in Sweden, why can't it work in the United States? So those ideas we're getting from other countries also. And that's a result of globalism, or globalization. Any questions about that? All right, before we take your quiz, a couple of things, guys. On your, when you're correcting your SCOTUS, I saw some things that um, are very common. So I need you to listen, because you may have made this mistake. When they ask you for the Hazelwood thing, Hazelwood versus Colmeyer, where the school censored um, a school publication, um, a lot of you put um, the common clause between them was no prior restraint. That's not a clause in the Constitution. There's no such thing as a no prior restraint clause. It's not even in the Constitution. What I'm looking for is the liberty that protects no prior restraint, which is what? What justifies government cannot censor publications? Freedom of the press. That's what I'm looking for, freedom of the press. Most of you got the idea. Guys, most of you did the smart thing, and you hedged your bets. And you said, prior restraint as protected by freedom of the press. I would count that right. You hedged your bets, that's fine with me. All right, another thing in that thing. Um, a lot of you were missing number B, a letter B, uh, for the Hazelwood case. You need to tell me what is the difference between the cases. You need to tell me why the Supreme Court decided differently. Why did they allow prior restraint in Hazelwood, and they did not allow prior restraint in um, New York Times versus um, United States? The main reason is the nature of the two newspapers. The New York Times versus a school newspaper, what's the difference? New York Times is an independent public newspaper. It's protected by which amendment? First Amendment. That other paper is what? It's school funded, it's school sponsored, it just goes to reason that who can control it? The school may be able to control it. Does that make sense? Next, on the Epperson case, this is about the freedom of religion case, about a lot of you are confusing the law. Arkansas made a law that banned the teaching of what? Evolution. Uh, evolution. evolution. They didn't make a law that thought evolution. They made a law that banned the teaching of evolution. Does that make sense for people? Some of you made a mistake about that. Let me see. On C, on the first one, where they ask you what could be the disagreements between the justices, that case, what is it about? Race. It's about race. Schools using race. Schools using race. Oh, I'm hearing acceptance. So what is that about? It's not segregation, guys. Segregation is separating people according to race. It could be about discrimination, right? But what is it about? When there's a tie, when they're deciding for a tiebreaker, they consider what? Race. race. So which one would they accept, minorities or whites? Usually, it was usually. What is that? It's affirmative action. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, it's okay. I said So which means in C, what could be the disagreement by the justices? The arguments for affirmative action and the arguments against affirmative action. You can put that on the letters. <laughs> All right, anyone else have any questions before we move on? All right, we have homework tonight. We'll take a quiz on this eventually. We'll have homework tonight. Okay.
Guys, make sure you correct. Most of you don't have a lot to correct. Oh, how many of you weren't here on Friday? At least also, right? How many of you? Guys, do it for homework. Wait, what? what? We do it for homework. Do it for homework. I'll correct them tomorrow. Do what? You don't have to. You can't if you want to. Oh, okay.
Okay. Yeah. 